start our services off this morning by singing uh, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. So, and you'll have bulletins there. So let's all stand and sing that first verse if you need to look at your paper. Consider yourself a wise man and woman. Well, I can tell you that according to Scripture, you are. You are considered wise in the eyes of the Lord this morning because you have seen the need to come and worship the King of kings and Lord of lords, that is Jesus Christ. So we're glad that you decided to be with us this morning as we praise the Lord through singing psalms, through preaching, through prayer. We uh, just enjoy this time to be together with the Lord. So uh, things going on this morning as far as uh, just some announcements. Today we are taking up the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for foreign uh, international missions. So uh, you'll see the red bucket that's been placed there. If you'd like to give to that, that'll all go towards uh, that Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, by Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, if you would like to give Christmas cards this year to the church family, then uh, the box has been placed there. And uh, starting Wednesday, or on Wednesday, we'll be taking those up and you can see how they will uh, be handled in the most sanitary, clean way that we can. And uh, so we'll take them up till Wednesday and then uh, be uh, passing those out come next Sunday. So uh, just be sure if you want to give those that you get them here by this coming Wednesday. As far as uh, other things going on, the only other thing there I see to mention is uh, December the 24th at 5 p.m. we'll be having our Christmas Eve service. Because of such, Miss Mendel coming in. Happy to be alive. <laughs> I think he is. He's late. We said he was happy to be alive this morning. He was <laughs> But uh, we, uh, on Christmas Eve, that's falling on a Thursday evening. Christmas Day is on a Friday. So uh, on Christmas Eve, that'll take the place of uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting that week. Wednesday night prayer meeting will be on the 23rd. So we won't have prayer meeting, but we will have the Christmas Eve service in here uh, at 5 o'clock and uh, just so you can plan accordingly I know dinners and things going on on Christmas Eve uh, we'll start at 5 and I can tell you uh, unless the Holy Spirit sparks uh, a revival uh, two or three hour revival will uh, be here about 30 minutes and uh, have candlelight have scripture reading have uh, singing and prayer and uh, looking forward to that as uh, we gather together and remember Christ's birth so uh, you'll see the Gideon's box is also available there. Uh, I got two cards that I want to read this morning. One I apologized for, it was given to me last week, and I want to be sure to read it this morning. So to our church family, we'd like to thank everyone for all the acts of kindness shown to us during the illness and loss of our loved one. Thank you for the food, flowers, the money, the cards, and your prayers, and please continue to remember us in your prayers. And that's from Judy and all of her family. Miss Roosevelt so much, but love y'all so much, and uh, we'll, 
we'll continue praying for you in these days ahead. I uh, got another card, thank you card here. The family of Ida Francis Driggs acknowledges grateful appreciation and kind expression of your sympathy. Thank you so much for all that you've done. We also want to thank the church family for all of their prayers. That's from Harvey, Tony, Arlene, and all of Ida's family. And uh, we are glad to have Tony here with us this morning. We are continuing to pray for you and uh, all of y'all's family and the loss of your grandmother. As far as other announcements, anything else going on? Yes, ma'am. Last Sunday was the last day to turn in um, the consent form for the Zoom with the youth ministry. Um, I didn't get but maybe a couple of you. So any adult that wants to participate in this Zoom, just make sure you get me your email address so we can um, have that to send out the invites. And Preacher Mark is going to be our first um, missionary that we're going to be highlighting in January. So get that email address to me as soon as you can so we can set that up. Thank you, Tam. Appreciate it. Anything else? Preacher. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this past Wednesday night, the Stewardship and Finance Committee met and we came up with a budget. I'm going to be passing out the budget sheets after service. The yellow column is what we are proposing for the coming year. We will be voting on January the 3rd at the quarterly business meeting. If you have any questions about it, please see somebody who's on the committee. Their names will be listed at the bottom of the sheet. The other columns are just to show you what our budget was this past year, what we have spent so far January through November, and again, the yellow column, though, is the one that we are proposing for the coming year. Gotcha. Thank you, Phyllis. Appreciate all the work that, that committee did to uh, prepare the budget. She said to ask any of the members of the committee, they're just going to go ask Phyllis, so if you just want to go ask Phyllis, we all get our information from her. But appreciate all your work in that. And, uh, I also want to thank all of the men and uh, ladies that came yesterday to clean up our churchyard and uh, got up all the leaves. We uh, split some wood, put some wood away for our wood ministry, and uh, just appreciate all y'all's help with that. It uh, took us about a half a day, and uh, really appreciate y'all's service to the Lord through uh, giving uh, that wood as well as getting up the leaves here and making the churchyard look so clean for this year as we uh, come to an end. Well, I want to read a passage of Scripture this morning. And uh, it's, it's an interesting passage just to uh, start thinking about the ministry of Jesus. You know, we, we celebrate His birth, then very soon we will celebrate Easter. Can you believe we're already thinking about that? But, uh, you know, I never really realized it in, in this passage, but if there was ever a verse that completely captured the entire ministry of Jesus, what He meant for us, what He meant for God sending Him, who Jesus was that we are to believe in in order to receive eternal life is completely captured in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And what's interesting is you go through the Scriptures, especially the New Testament, go through and look at every time there's a 316. I don't know what it is. It was something of divine origin that I can't explain because, you know, when Paul wrote this letter, when uh, the Gospel writers wrote there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They had no intentions of chapter numbers and verse numbers. Y'all all know that, that that was later added to the Scriptures. But in almost all of the New Testament passages, 316 means so much in every one of those uh, Scriptures. And here in 1 Timothy 316, we see the uh, ministry of Jesus, what He means for us. He says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. He was seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. That's the entire life of Jesus summarized in 1 Timothy 3.16. He was manifested in the flesh. He was God with us. That's what I really want you to keep in your minds as we go forth through the service this morning. We're going to be talking about the incarnation of Jesus, how Jesus was fully God and fully man in His birth, in His life, in His death, in His resurrection. And so God was manifested in the flesh. That's the definition of the incarnation. That's one of the clearest explanations that could ever be given on who Jesus was as He laid there in a manger and as He went forth and He grew in stature and He grew in wisdom and in favor with God and man. That's who Jesus was. He was God in the flesh. So keep that in mind this morning as we go through and worship Him today. As uh, we move into prayer time this morning, uh, I know Don's going to have a second dose. Don led us in prayer last week uh, for Andy. 
and uh, I'll have him lead us again this morning. But uh, just to give you some uh, prayer updates as we enter into prayer time, we, uh, as you know, Bonnie Wilson uh, passed out in the parking lot last week, and uh, she's doing much better. She was, you know, taken to the hospital during service last week, but she's doing much better. They released her around two o'clock that evening uh, on the same day, and uh, she's had a few doctor's appointments this past week since then, and. Everything's coming back clear. Everything looks well. Uh, really aren't seeing what caused it, but uh, just some things to keep an eye on. So they appreciate the prayers and are doing well. I uh, don't know how many had heard about Betty Hart, but uh, Betty Hart did have a stroke on Friday morning and uh, was airlifted to Duke Hospital. She uh, was uh, able to get there and have emergency surgery where they removed a blood clot that was going to her brain and uh, in removing that blood clot she's improved ever since she's been able to uh, talk to her grandkids to jane she's been able to feed herself she gave two thumbs up on a video call yesterday and uh, still a long ways to go no doubt with her speech and figuring out her abilities they're supposed to get her up and walk today but uh, she had an allergic reaction last night to some aspirin that they gave so that's kind of give her a little setback in moving from the ICU to a regular room there at Duke. But uh, keep James in your prayers. James hasn't been able to see her. He's letting Jim kind of handle everything, going back and forth, and Jim's the only one that can see her. So uh, definitely keep their family in your prayers and keep Betty in your prayers for healing uh, in that situation. But I'll let Don take uh, all the other requests and reports of praise this morning and uh, lead us in corporate prayer. Good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good. Thank you all, all for coming this morning. At this time in our service, we do uh, come before the Lord in prayer. Uh, are there any other special requests this morning other than uh, Jane and Betty and, uh, and Bonnie? Are there any others? Daryl Beck, he's at Danville Hospital on the middle of the code. You don't remember him? Okay. Any, any more? Leah's for Chaska, Mike's sister, she has done. Who? Leah's. Okay. Chaska. Any praises this week? We praise, they pray, we got baptized, and there's a new member of our church. Okay, yeah. Uh, beautiful well, that's a praise. We had a good time yesterday, cleaned the yard, and then wood ministry. And uh, we have a lot to be thankful. So Deborah, if you'll play a few minutes and uh, we'll all uh, uh, engage in prayer and then I'll close. <laughs> Assembly, 
And may we all receive a blessing from the message that they will be bringing this morning. Lead him and guide him through this presentation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. we lit the hope candle. This symbolizes God's hope um, and forgiveness towards men and the expectation of the coming Messiah. Last Sunday we lit the second Advent candle which was the preparation candle symbolizing faith and reminding us about the experience Joseph and Mary had in the city of Bethlehem. Matthew 2, 10 and 11 tells us, When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Today we light the purple, I mean the joy candle. that very fitting for Kate to light the joy candles. He experienced the greatest joy last Sunday being received as a member of the church in baptism. It's a little bit warmer this Sunday. <laughs> he said that water was cold last Sunday. We went in. We we're working on it, trying to get it fixed. Well, with the Holy Word of God in front of us this morning, I'm uh, going to ask you to go ahead and start turning to Matthew. And uh, we're going to be in uh, Matthew chapter 1 for a period of time. And uh, today marks 12 days till Christmas. Can you believe that? I'm, uh, I'm glad to see it. I'm glad that we're almost here. I know that uh, I'm glad to see the approaching end of this year and all that it's had to offer us. And uh, you know, when you think about joy, you think about uh, those things, and then you think about the early church, you think about who Peter was writing to, and they were being persecuted, being killed for their faith. You think about all of those folks that uh, were martyred, all of the disciples except for John were killed because of the name of Jesus Christ that they so trusted in. And uh, we sit here and talk about how bad of a year we've had, and it's just been awful, this, that, and that. It has been, but we haven't lost our life because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And so a lot of times, you know, we, we can be comforted in knowing that there's people worse off than we are. And uh, sometimes it just helps to remind ourselves of that. But today is 12 days till Christmas. I reckon we can start singing that song. A partridge in a pear tree is what we're all supposed to receive today. But uh, I don't know what I'd do with a partridge in a pear tree. But for some reason we sing that song every year. You can but, see it next uh, to your bobcat. Huh? Put it next to your bobcat. Next to my bobcat, yeah. <laughs> keep, keep watch over the chickens in the dog lot. <laughs> I don't know where I can fit that in there, but, I like it. but uh, as, as we've been approaching Christmas, I've been leading you through the Christmas carol that we all know very well, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and uh, this Sunday and next Sunday we'll wind up that song, but we've been taking the biblical truths found in the lines of that song, especially the first three verses of that song, and looking at the scriptures, seeing how is that song built upon the foundation of scripture, how it is so accurate with the uh, actual birth of Jesus and what it meant for God sending His Son to mankind. And so we uh, first of all began by looking at glory to the newborn king. When we sing that song, that's the second line in the song, uh, glory to the newborn king focusing on the uh, king that was born, the, the kingdom that he came and preached the message of that was able to be attained through the king that was Jesus and how he still reigns to this day. And when he returns, he will establish his millennial reign and we will be joint heirs if we have so trusted in him and have accepted him into our hearts, souls, and minds. And then last week we looked at the statement made in the third verse, uh, born to give us second birth. That was just a very loaded uh, lyric in this song. 
of how Jesus was born in order that we could be born again. How we must be born again in order to enter into that kingdom that He came and preached about. We must be born again spiritually. We must accept Jesus Christ, cast off the old self that is full of sin, and be filled by the Holy Spirit that comes in and cleanses us of that sin in order that we can stand before God holy, without spot, blameless, truly, as we are entered into the kingdom. And so today we're going to be looking at a truth made in the second verse of the song. I know it's not necessarily in order, but I wanted to tie in last week with the baptism we were going to have. But uh, here in the second verse, there is a statement made that uh, I believe is of utmost importance for us to understand of Jesus being born of a virgin, of Jesus being born in the first place. Why was it necessary? Why couldn't Jesus just come as the angels did in a divine way and come and pronounce His kingdom and then go and be back at the right hand of the throne of God? Why did He have to be born into mankind and be born a man for that matter? And uh, so we're going to see that this morning. But I just want to clarify why we're looking at this song in order to uh, understand the Scriptures. Out of anything that humans can remember, songs are definitely up there at the top of the list. We can sing a song that we learned as a young child decades later. And so my hope is, is that as we go through the lyrics of this song, is that when you sing it decades later, as I know you'll all still be here decades later, as we sing that later on, you'll remember the scriptures that go along with the lines of the song, the truths that this song tells us about. And when you're singing that, you'll say, well, I know that comes from Matthew, or that comes from Luke chapter 2, or that comes from... And so you'll remember the truth of that from scripture as you sing it year after year. And so this morning, in that second verse, the phrase that we're looking at today is, Veiled in the flesh, the Godhead see. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. It comes at this point in the song that I really like where you're getting ready to just belt out that verse. You know how the verses kind of go along there. Christ by highest heaven adorned, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold Him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. You know that first part of that is kind of a, a descending. I don't know a lot about music. I played trumpet for a couple of years. But uh, you're kind of descending in your tone and in the way you're singing. But then when you get to this uh, particular statement, you're starting to build back up. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. You know, you're building back up in that song before you get to the actual chorus. And so that statement, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, it is full of the deep scriptural truth of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Now, incarnation is a large word. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. That's hard for us to understand. It's not words that we use every day. It's talking about Jesus being fully God and fully man at the same time. It's one of those concepts we've all heard at some point, whether in a devotional, whether it be in preaching, whether it be... Uh, just from scrolling through the radio, scrolling through TV, at some point in your life, even outside of church, you have heard that Jesus, we believe, was fully God and fully man. He received and uh, had within Him dwelling the full deity of God and all of the flesh of man except for sin at the same time. That's the incarnation of Jesus. And so as we think about that this morning, this statement helps us better understand what is meant by God in the flesh, God with us. Those verses that we know uh, kind of comes to light here in this statement. And so when we look at the scriptures this morning, as we see Jesus was and is God in the flesh, we're going to see that Jesus was born fully God. Not just God's character, not just God's nature, not just God's uh, power, but all of those combined Jesus had dwelling within him. We're also going to see that in Him, the glory of God resides and will continue to reside for all of eternity. And then we're going to see that although the glory of God was veiled by His body of flesh, that's what it's talking about in that song, veiled in flesh, we see God. Even though the glory of God was veiled, at certain times, Jesus chose to remove the veil. And we're going to talk about those times when we saw the glory of God or when the Gospel writers saw the glory of God displayed in the person of Jesus. And then we'll finally see that through the birth, 
through the birth of Jesus, it led us to be able to not only see God, but be in the presence of God through this child that was born in Bethlehem almost 2,000 years ago. And so I want to pray for us, and then uh, we'll look at Matthew chapter 1 here. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. Lord, we thank you uh, that this room is full. It's full of <coughs> brothers and sisters in Christ. It's full of believers in you and those that want to learn more about you and uh, gather together to worship you, Father. We thank you for them. And Lord, I just pray now that you speak through me, that you use me to uh, administer your truths. And Father, I pray that you open the hearts, souls, and minds of those that are able to hear this message, uh, whether it be electronically, whether it be here in person. Father, we just pray that they not only hear this message, but apply it to their lives so that they can be better followers of you. And since we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 1, I want to look at verses 22 and 23 this morning, and the gospel writer of Matthew here, we know that uh, he is the one that explains kind of the behind the scenes of what goes on leading up to the birth of Jesus. He's talking about here, as we approach verse 18 and following, he's talking about the, uh, I won't even say marital struggle, but the... Uh, troubles that Mary and Joseph are having in receiving the news that they are going that Mary's going to be bringing the son of God into the world that she is going to be with child from the holy spirit and so as they receive this news as the angel appears to them and gives them this uh, pronouncement and the reason why I look at this is because the song is hark the herald angels sing whether they were singing about the and we know the angels didn't necessarily sing but whether it was to the shepherds saying that a the Christ has been born in Bethlehem, you'll find him laying in a manger, glory to God in the highest, whether it's that pronouncement or whether it's the pronouncement made here in a dream to Mary and Joseph, we know that it is the uh, herald of the angels that are proclaiming this good news of Jesus being born. And so when we pick up here in verse 22 of Matthew chapter 1, Matthew says, So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. One of the interesting things about Matthew is that he's very adamant in pointing out Old Testament prophecies being fulfilled by the life of Jesus Christ. He's saying here, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. It's like he just steps back for a minute after he's explained Mary and Joseph receiving the news from the angel. He steps back for a moment and says, this is happening because of what Isaiah told us would happen. This is taking place because God promised it would take place. And so that promise is there in verse 23 where he says, the uh, prophet says, this is taken from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Now I wonder if Isaiah, when he received that prophecy from God, when he literally received the words of the Lord to deliver unto Judah, did he really understand what that meant? And, and Isaiah was a man just like us. He was a man and a prophet of God. But I think it would have been hard for him 700 years before this actually took place. I think it would have been hard for him to understand how a virgin was going to have a child, first of all. And then second of all, how God would be with us. That name of Jesus is given here of Emmanuel. And the meaning of Emmanuel is even given, which says it's translated God with us us. As I said about 1 Timothy 3.16, I say about Matthew 1.23, that's the definition of the incarnation. That is what it means for Jesus to be fully God and fully man. He was born of a woman, just like every one of us was born of a woman, even though it was of a virgin and that he was born sinless, but he was born of woman and at the same time he was God. And so that is the incarnation, that is Jesus' deity and Jesus' humanity being displayed at the same time here at His birth and even before He's born as Mary receives the news that He's going to be born. So we, when we take that statement, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, we come to understand that in the flesh of Jesus' body, that body that Jesus received there in the womb of His mother Mary, the virgin that was of Nazareth, when we hear that statement, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, all the other disciples, as well as Matthew, they realized that when they saw Jesus, they saw God. 
when Jesus stood before them, whether it was on the mountainside, they're teaching them, explaining to them about the kingdom of God, explaining to them about the requirements of God with their lives and what they were supposed to do with them and being a follower of Him, they saw God teaching them. And I think a lot of times we don't realize that. There's so many people in society that says, you know, Jesus was a good man. I, I even believe that He was a righteous man. A lot of people say that. But to explain and be able to grasp that He was God and the Son of God is so hard sometimes. And what I think is, is of utmost necessity and, and what I find frustrating a lot of times is when people come to the Scriptures, especially something hard like this, like the incarnation of Jesus, what people will do a lot of times is they say, well, I don't know if I believe that because I can't understand it. You ever heard that? I don't know if I can believe that because I can't understand it. Never say you can't believe something the Bible says. Because you're not going to understand everything that's in you. I'm not a smart man. I went to school for a little while to study how to study the Bible. But I don't understand everything that's in here. I never will. I'm humble enough to tell you when you ask me questions, I say, I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever know the answer until we go and be with the one that gave us the Scriptures. But what I do know is that everything given to us in the Holy Scriptures must be believed in. It doesn't have to be always understood, but it has to be believed in. In Colossians, I ask you to turn there. I told you we'd spend just a little time in Matthew. I want, you to, want us to go to Colossians chapter 2. And as we turn to Colossians chapter 2, you know, some, some say that they believe the power of God rested in Jesus. They say, I definitely saw, I definitely saw that uh, Jesus was able to do things that only could be explained by the power of God with healing people from the dead, from healing people that were blind and mute and able to heal leprosy. And I agree that you were able to see the power of God with what Jesus did. But at the same time, we should be able to see that in Jesus resided not only His power, but His character, His nature, His attributes. God's entire being and God's entire glory rested in the person of Jesus. Now, it was hard to see at times because it was veiled. What is a veil? You think about when a bride, that they're starting to kind of go away now. You don't see it as many times. But maybe some of you that got married, you wore a veil. And it kind of obscures your beauty for a certain period of time until uh, the husband comes and lifts it off of you and they pronounce you husband and wife and he kisses his bride. But that's what that veil does. It, it just for a period of time obscures what is desired to be seen. That's not a Mary Webster definition, that's an Ian Rigney definition of a veil. But that's what a veil does. It, it makes it hard to see, but you can still see parts of it. And then when we think about Jesus' flesh, the, the body that He received, that's what His flesh did for God's glory. We were able to see glimpses of it, we were able to see parts of it, but for us to see the fullness of it, we don't realize until we read about the Word. We read about the Word was with God, the Word was God. And as we come to Colossians chapter 2 here, we realize that the glory of God was within this man. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, For in Him dwells all the fullness. Now, let me say that Him is Jesus Christ here. Uh, in Colossians, here, uh, many times He is explaining... Uh, when I say He, I'm talking about Paul and Timothy. They are the authors of Colossians here. They are explaining the person of Christ. Not just the godliness of Christ, but the person that is Jesus Christ. And let me even back up and say in chapter 1, verse 15, He's already made a mention of Jesus being God and saying that He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. As you work through chapter 1, you come to verse 19. They say, for it pleased the Father that in Jesus, in Him, all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself, by Him, whether things on earth or in things in heaven, having made peace through the blood 
of his cross. They are explaining why the person of Jesus is so important for mankind. And then as we come to Colossians chapter 2 here, they haven't actually got to visit the church in Colossae at this time. They tell in the first eight verses of chapter 2 that they wish they could be there and explain more to them about the mysteries of God, the mysteries of Christ, how it is that Jesus was able to be God. And uh, we find that there in uh, chapter 2, verse 3, where it says, I'm getting older, it's hard to see these little numbers. Chapter 2, verse 3, where it says, so I'll just start in verse 2 because I can't find number 3. There it is. In whom are hidden, this is Jesus, in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and and knowledge, and it's talking about the mystery of God that is residing there in Christ. And, and now let me bring us to verse 9 in chapter 2. For in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principalities and power. So in Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead. That's one of those words used in that statement in Hark the Herald Angel Sings that we're looking at this morning. So Although the Godhead, what, what is the Godhead, first of all? The Godhead is everything that is of God. His character, His nature, His power, His divinity, everything of God resides in the Godhead. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all of that. It is the entirety of God is what the Godhead, as the authors use it here, that's what it's talking about. So in Christ, in Him, dwells all the fullness of God and then that last word of verse 9 there says, it dwelled in him bodily. And so that is the Godhead being not necessarily covered, but veiled by the body, that bodily Godhead that was in Jesus. So when we read that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that he was laid in a manger, the episode of Christ's humble birth, it can be easy for us to overlook the fact that this was God. This was God being born of man to us. As we go back to Matthew 1, God with us. That is who Emmanuel was. And that's exactly though why His birth was the way it was. It's so that we could recognize that He was a man just like us. You know, in the Scriptures you read about Jesus, He was the Son of Man. He was also the Son of God. That is that coming together. And then when we read here in Colossians 1, 19 and 20, that's the reason why I read it, is it says that because, I'm, I'm just taking into verse 19 and 20 and putting it in one explanation, because the fullness of the Father dwelled in the Son, we were then able to be reconciled to the Father through the Son. We were then able to be from sinful man to righteous God, we were then able to come together as one through the Son of God, that is Jesus Christ. And so that's why He was born to us. And that's why it's so important this time of year. We, we focus so many times on the death, the resurrection, the burial, everything that took place at the end of Jesus' life. But if Jesus had never been born, none of those things would have ever taken place. And so that's why His birth is so important. All of the... Uh, Specific details of his birth are so important. And then verse 10 of Colossians 2, And you are complete in him who is the head of all principalities and power. Because Jesus was God, we were made complete by him because we have accepted him. Only those that have accepted Him will be made complete by Him. What do we mean by me being made complete? That's again being reconciled to God. There is no longer any division between us and God, but rather we have been brought into the Lord's presence by the birth, by the death, by the burial, by the resurrection of He who we believe in, that is Jesus. So since He is above all, the last part there, who is the head of all principalities, and all power, that too gives us evidence that He is God. God is above all, He's through all, He's even in us all, those that believe in Him. And so when we look around and we start putting our faith in vaccines, we start putting our faith in doctors, we start saying, well, when is this hope for us going to come? We have to remind ourselves of the scriptural truth that our hope, that our uh, etern eternality, 
everything that is authoritative rests in the person of Jesus Christ. Going back to the message uh, that we began with, glory to the newborn King. He is above all, in all, and through us all. So the Godhead was clearly in Jesus. Although it was veiled, although it was covered obscurely for periods of time, Jesus saw certain times where it was necessary to reveal God's glory to those that would see. Think about in His birth. In His birth, people started to gather because of what? Because of a star. Because they saw in that star that was residing there some kind of way above the manger, above the stable that they were in, they saw God's glory in some kind of way to be attracted to that star. That was just God revealing His glory at Jesus' birth. And then as you go through, you see in Jesus' life that God's glory was there at Jesus' baptism. The Spirit descended in the form of a dove. And can you just imagine those that were gathered by the riverside, how God spoke from heaven and said, This is my Son with whom I'm well pleased. The Gospel writers accounted as such. And so they actually heard the words of God coming from heaven. So the glory of God was seen in this man that had just been baptized. And then you go forth and you see in Jesus' transfiguration, when He was there on the mount with Moses and Elijah, Peter saw the glory of God. He saw it so vividly that he said, let me pitch a tent for our uh, friends that are here with us today. And uh, can you just imagine the glory of God being shown by Jesus in that time? And then you think about Jesus' ascension. Can you just watch this man that you followed for three and a half years, you've known about for 33 and a half years, you watch him be lifted into heaven. To actually go and be in the glory of God at the right hand of God's throne. That is witnessing the power, the character, the nature, the abilities of God in the person of Jesus. So at specific times, He took down the veil of His flesh, if you will, and let the glory seep through for all to see that He is God. Not through any other actions, not through the miracles, not through what He was able to teach about, but just in His person. Just in who you saw, you could see God. You could see the glory of God residing within Him. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 20. You might say, well, you're looking at a lot of verses this morning. I had about 15, so that was process of elimination. I, I knocked it down to four for this morning. And I uh, just want to look at Hebrews 10 and then Mark 15 this morning, and uh, we'll conclude. Hebrews 10, 19 through 20. The author of Hebrews here, he's just finished explaining. He began in chapter 4, and he began explaining what Jesus meant for humanity, who Jesus was, and what Jesus' death meant for us, and how His sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, how it satisfied the penalty for sin. And thus, He is our great high priest. He is the one that we go through in order to come into God's presence. So Hebrews 10, 19-20 says, Therefore, brethren, since it says therefore, we know something has been explained before, and that's that Jesus' sacrifice paid the price for us. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh. It's a lot going on in just those two verses. I, I was going to go to verse 24, but for sake of time, I knew I couldn't this morning. But in verse 19 there, it says, Since Jesus died in our place, therefore, since Jesus died in our place, we can do what? We can enter into the holiest. What is the holiest? That's the presence of God. That is going into God's glory we are now able to do. That's what we're doing right now. Those of you that have trusted in Jesus Christ, you've made a profession of faith, you said, Lord, I believe in You. I ask You to forgive me of my sin. You confess those sins to Him. He came and lived within your life and dwells within your heart right now. You're able now to enter into the holiest. See, before this, before Jesus was born, before Jesus died and resurrected, the only way to go into the presence of God was through a priest, through the high priest. He would go into the temple, and as he walked into the temple, I could show you a diagram, but as he walked into the temple, in the back of the temple, as he walked in, if you will, there was a veil. There was an uh, actual curtain, if you will, that was there that separated everything else in the temple from the holiest place in the temple that was the Holy of Holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was located. And the Ark of the Covenant is where God's 
Well, that's where God resided with man. That's where God's presence was. And so, up until the sending of Jesus, that's how you came before God. But now this tells us, how do we enter into the holiest place? How do we enter into God's throne? By the blood of Jesus. Five words right there at the end of verse 19. By the blood of Jesus, because the blood of Jesus was shed for us, because He died in our place on the cross for all sin, we can now enter into the presence of the Lord. That's why when we go to prayer, we go to prayer and we pray for somebody that's going through a difficult time, whether it's loss of a loved one, whether it's a medical emergency, whether it's comfort and peace or, or whatever it is, that's why we're comforted in knowing that we can go before the throne of God spiritually. We can go to God and say, Lord, this is what I need. And that would have never been possible. You would have never been able to have a conversation with God the way that we do today were it not for the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross. And because Jesus was made of flesh and blood, because Jesus was a man just like you and I, He was able, and this sounds so uh, rational, he, because He had blood in Him, He was able to shed blood for us, and that is the only way we could be saved. That's how He was God with us. Because His divine blood was shed, we can go and be with God. Verse 20, By a new and living way. This is no longer in the Old Covenant. This is no longer a means in which the, the, the high priest have just lost their job. Because there is no need for them any longer to go and on your behalf speak to God. But rather by a new and living way, the new covenant that is established by Jesus, which He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh. Can you imagine the writer of that song? I mean, he was looking. Charles Wesley was looking at Hebrews 10, 19 when he wrote the third line, the second line of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Veiled in flesh, the God had seen. Jesus' flesh was the veil of the holiest of holies. It was the veil to the glory of God. And because we have been covered, because we are veiled in the blood of Jesus spiritually, because our hearts have been filled by the righteous blood of Jesus, we can now go into the Father's presence. We can now be with. Can you imagine that? We're going to be with the Godhead. And we can still do it now through prayer, through worship, through praise. We're doing it right now. We are worshiping God. We're coming into His presence with prayers of thanksgiving, with declarations of praise. This verse truly tells us that we will see God. And, and I, I envy I envy the writers of Hebrews and of 1 Timothy and of all of these that we've looked at this morning, Colossians and Matthew. I envy them because they saw Jesus. And because they saw Jesus, they saw God. But then we might say, well, how is this possible? You know, this is a hard concept for us to understand. How is it possible for Jesus at certain times to hide His glory, or, or veil His glory anyways? How is that possible through His flesh? In the song itself, in, in the same song, in verse 3, it says, Mild He lay His glory by. Mild He lay His glory by. Jesus had the ability, being God, He had the ability to lay His glory aside, temporarily and voluntarily set it aside so that then He could live a life that was comparable to ours. He could live a life to set forth the standard and the example that God required for all mankind to live in order to go and be with Him. He is our high priest. Verse 21 there of Hebrews 10. And having this a high priest over the house of of God. I said I wasn't going to do it. I'm going to keep reading. Verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled. Sprinkled by what? Sprinkled by the blood of Jesus from an evil conscience. And our bodies are washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For He who promised is faithful. I can't not read those verses. Praise God. We have the hope in Him that is promised and His faithful. In Mark chapter 15, verse 37, this is normally a passage we look at when uh, we do celebrate Easter, when we think about that time of Jesus' death and resurrection. But what I, I hope I'm doing for you, and, and you're able to see in the Scriptures that I use, 
is that we're going from the manger. We're going from the time of Jesus' birth all the way to what His life, what His death, what His burial, resurrection meant. And so here in Mark chapter 15, verse 37, we pick up in this solemn time of our, our Savior and His death. When He breathed His last words. When He was there on the cross, the Romans have beat Him, they have whipped Him, they have spat on Him, they have placed a crown of thorns and twisted it upon His head. When they treated Him so because God's people told them to, we see the final breath of Jesus and what it does for mankind. Mark chapter 15, verse 37. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed His last. You can look at the other Gospels and see exactly what He said. But what's amazing about Jesus' death is the way in which He died. And some of us will say, well, I'm not so sure I, I catch that, Ian. It says, after He had been beaten, after He had been placed upon the cross, after He had carried His own cross, can you imagine Jesus being man, how completely drawn He was, completely exhausted the Son of God had became. As He was there on the cross, it says He breathed His last. But before He breathed His last, what does it say He did? He cried out with a loud voice. He had enough energy, He had enough ability, enough power to cry out to God to exclaim this great uh, and you can go forward and see all that he says but what's amazing about that is that when he cried out that's when Jesus gave up his spirit the Romans couldn't kill the son of God the Jews couldn't kill the son of God no matter how many nails they thrust into his body no matter how many times they took the spear and shoved it into his side whether or not they broke His legs, they could not have killed Jesus. The only way Jesus could die because He was God was to give His Spirit up for us. And when He cried out, that's when He gave up His Spirit. That's when He gave up His life for us. None of the other stuff leading up to was necessary. But it shows us what He was willing to do out of love for us in that while we were still sinners, He died for us. Going on into verse 38, then, after Jesus cried out, after He breathed His last, Mark 15, 38, then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Jesus is on Mount Calvary at this time. I hope to visit Jerusalem one day and put all of this, put a, uh, what we say, a face with the name. Jesus was on, that, on Mount Calvary, surrounded by two prisoners there on either side of them. We have it displayed in our uh, cemetery there. As it was on Mount Calvary, in nearby Jerusalem was the temple. I'm sure people were there to worship. I'm sure people were there to continue on because they have sent off this fraud, this false Messiah that He claimed. They've sent Him off and they're going back to their ways of worship. But there in the temple, as these people were there, there had to have been a there had to have been a witness in order for Mark to record it here. As Jesus took His final breath there on the cross, there in nearby Jerusalem in the temple was the Holy of Holies. There was the veil. There was the altar of incense. There was all of those things there in the temple for orderly worship to God and to come into God's presence. And what Jesus' death did was it showed that that veil was no longer necessary. There was no reason for the holiness of God to not be available for all mankind. Because through Jesus' death, that penalty of sin for us to be divided from God that began all the way at the Garden of Eden, that began when Adam and Eve took the bite of that fruit, when that division between man and God came, there was a need for that veil. There was a need for us to be separated from God. But now, since Jesus had died, since He had paid the penalty of that sin, the temple veil was torn in two from top to bottom. It was no longer needed. Anyone could now pass through into the presence of God by the veil of the flesh, the Godhead that resided in the person of Jesus that we all are able to accept. So before I read this last verse in verse 39, I want you to think about the life experience that got Jesus to this place. 
<clears throat> what all Jesus went through, and I was thinking about this morning as we read through Luke in Sunday school, you know, we have a lot about His birth, and we have a lot about His ministry. But there was about 27 years there that we don't know exactly what all went on. We know that he was a carpenter under his father. We know that he um, was trained up by Joseph and was in the temple teaching occasionally. But think about Jesus' life. What got him to this point? It can be very easy for us to remember the miraculous birth of our Savior. But when Easter rolls around, the only hope we find in Easter is not here. It's hard for us to think about His death. It, it almost makes us feel guilty. It should have been us on the cross. It should have been us paying that price. So we always look at Easter at the resurrection. We even call it Resurrection Sunday because that was the day that Jesus rose from the grave. And if He hadn't risen, obviously we wouldn't have any hope. But at the same time, if He hadn't died, He would have never had the ability to rise again. So the fact of the matter is that everything leading up to this point in Jesus' life was necessary. Everything that He went through, all the miracles that He gave, He was sent to God's people. He was sent to the Jews. He was the promised Messiah to God's people. And the God's people led Him to this point. The Jews led Him to this point that He was being crucified by a Roman centurion there on Mount Calvary. That's what Jesus was born to do. We don't like to think about that at Jesus' birth. We like to think about the shepherds and how they were amazed at the news of Christ's birth. We like to think about the wise men and their travelings coming to visit the King of the Jews. But Jesus was born to die. And He knew that when He was in His mother's womb in Bethlehem, when He was in His mother's womb in Nazareth before they even came to Bethlehem. He knew that He was born to die. And so everything had been completed. And then He gave up His spirit. He cried out with that loud voice. The veil of the temple was torn to show everyone and even us today that read about it that Jesus was now the veil that we passed through in order to come into God's presence. And the reason why I want you to contemplate this verse that I'm going to read here to close this morning is simply this. is Think about when you breathe your last. Think about when, you, when your time comes. We all have that appointed time unless Christ returns first. Think about that time when you are either going to cry out with a loud voice or you're going to maybe, hopefully, peacefully pass away. Whenever that time comes in your life, what did you do with it? What did you believe? Who has your life in His hands when you pass from this life? It's either Satan or God. Either you've entered into God's presence through the veil of Jesus covering your heart, or it's given by default to Satan. So have you trusted in Jesus as Emmanuel, as the Messiah, as God with us? We can be a follower of Jesus. And in being a follower of Jesus, we know that we have seen God. We've already seen Him in our salvation. We've seen His glory. And we see the hope. But I want you to believe Jesus wants you to believe. The Bible teaches us that we must believe as the Roman centurion believed here. Some scholars say that this man that crucified Jesus didn't become a believer. But I believe in this statement he's going to make, it shows us his faith in Jesus. But it took Jesus' death to realize who Jesus was. I pray that it doesn't take your death to realize who Jesus is. Mark chapter 15, verse 39. So when the centurion, who stood opposite of him, saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Let's pray together. Lord God, I am humbled. I'm humbled at the clarity of Your Word. Lord, I realize sometimes we just take for granted how much truth is here. And Lord, I pray for those that hear this message. I pray, Lord, that they understand the need for Your Son, Jesus. Father, I pray that it not take their death to see who the King is. I pray that it not take even their deathbed to realize who they must trust in. 
Because even the man that had your son killed realized that Jesus was not only a righteous man, but He was the Son of God. Father, I am thankful that You sent Your Son Jesus 2,000 years ago to die. And Lord, we don't want to say that we're thankful for His death, but we are because if it were not Him, it would have been us. We would have died with no hope. But He died in our place so that we could rise again in His resurrection. And so Lord, I pray that if there's one here today that has not had their heart, soul, and mind filled by the spiritual blood of Jesus, if they haven't accepted Jesus as their personal Savior, I pray, Lord, that they make that decision today. That it not take another moment to pass by on this world for them to realize they need to be forgiven of their sin and cleansed of all unrighteousness by that of your Son, Jesus. And Lord, right now, I just picture this prayer. As I pray, Lord, the Holy Spirit leads me to say exactly what I need to say as He dwells within me. And as my fellow brothers and sisters pray, the Holy Spirit's leading them to say exactly what needs to be said. And then Jesus, the veil, receives every one of these requests, not just right now on Sunday morning, but every moment as we wake up, as we lie down, as we eat. The Lord receives those requests and delivers them unto you. Father, I'm just so thankful that we can have a personal relationship with You. That we can converse with You and come into the Holy of Holies at any time for Your comfort, for Your divine peace, for all that You give us until our time comes to be with You forever. This we thank You for in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The altar is open. If you need to do business with the Lord this morning, if you need to... Be changed, repent of your sin, cleansed of that unrighteousness, then you can do so this morning. You don't have to have me lead you, but I will if so request it. But uh, if you'd like to come forward this morning, then uh, we invite you to do so as we sing the first Noel that you have there in your book.